Wow. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, and welcome to Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship. I'm Reverend Paul Beckel. On Mother's Day, we celebrate those who nurture and sustain us. We say thank you to biological mothers, adoptive mothers, grandmothers, Mother Earth, and so many others who, because their title doesn't have the word mother in it, too often go unrecognized for the nurturing, loving care that they provide without a second thought, simply because it is part of who they are. Today, let's find inspiration from the experiences of giving and receiving love, stories of love that empowers and sustains, from those whose stories are not typically told on Mother's Day. If you have a chalice at home, please join me in lighting your chalice. If you do not have a chalice or a candle, please join me in spirit as I light the chalice and we'll begin together to say our covenant. Let's say together, love is the spirit of this fellowship and service gives it life. Celebrating our diversity and joined by a quest for truth, we work for peace and honor all creation. This is our covenant. And let's sing together number 163 in the gray hymnal and also with lyrics on your screen, for the earth forever turning. Mother Gaia, the sacred earth, is old and young, harried and resilient, ordinary, beautiful, sensitive, tough, perplexing, steady, stubborn, and yet yielding. Her creatures sometimes simply respond to their environment out of instinct to the conditions in which they are placed. They do what one would expect. But sometimes it seems as if they can foresee the consequences, maybe even act because of or despite the foreseeable difficulties 
or in defiance of expectations. And that leads me to our story today, which is called Little Pink Pup. by Johanna Kirby. This book is dedicated to all the children who think that they are different from the rest of their families. Just remember your family loves you just the way you are. One cold night, 12 piglets were born in a barn. The smallest one was named Pink. Pink's brother and sister piglets were strong and healthy, but he was tiny and weak. They were playful and pushed Pink aside when it was time to eat. Pink was cold and hungry. His owners brought him into their house to see if they could help Pink. Tink was a brand new dachshund Mom, she had one puppy of her own and was a foster mom to a few others. When Tink saw Pink, she immediately welcomed him into the family. She licked him and fed him and tucked him in close. She made him feel right at home. Tink knew that Pink was different from her puppies, but she didn't mind. Now, Tink had a lot of brown puppies and one little pink pup. Pink's new siblings welcomed him, too. He may not have looked like them, but that didn't matter. He was just their size. The puppies didn't sleep on straw like the pigs in the barn. They slept on a soft blanket, and their warm bodies kept Pink cozy. Little by little, Pink started to eat more. Nobody pushed him away. He began to grow stronger along with his puppy siblings. Soon, Pink was running around the house. They liked to wrestle and nip at each other. They chased each other and played tag. Pink loved to have his ears scratched but he hated taking a bath. When it was bath time, he would squeal loudly and kick out his legs. Sometimes, Pink would visit his pig family in the barn. His pig siblings had grown so big. They were about 20 pounds each, and Pink weighed only three pounds. After his visit, Pink was always happy to go back to Tink and the dog family. Once Pink and the puppies got a little older, it was time to eat solid food. But when Pink was offered pig food, he refused to eat. He wanted puppy food like his brothers and sisters. When Pink got too big to live in the house, he moved into the barn, but he made to sure he made sure to take his doggy bed with him. After sleeping on a soft cushion his whole life, he did not like the scratchy straw. The dogs missed Pink, but they would still play with him in the barn. And no matter how big Pink grows, he will always be Tink's little pink pup. The, um, the postscript... Our family lives on a small farm where we raise pigs, horses, goats, dogs, and cats. We particularly love pigs for their personalities and enjoy just watching them root around the pen. My four children raise pigs for 4-H, a program dedicated to providing hands-on education for youth across America 
by learning leadership, citizenship, and life skills. The highlight of every spring is when a new litter of pigs is born. Last year, our sow delivered 12 piglets. One of them was premature, so we brought him inside and one of our dachshunds became his foster mom. When we put some photos on the internet, people from all over the country contacted us and we knew their story was special. Dachshunds are known for being good mothers and they're also very sweet and funny. It is amazing how much compassion and love an animal can have for not only their own babies, but a baby from a completely different species. Thanks to Tink's love, Pink is thriving on the farm today. Johanna Kirby, Elizabeth, West Virginia. Now let's take a moment to ease our bodies into their natural state of newness. Shake off our tensions, breathe, not, not in that natural state of brand newness of being thrust into the shocking world for the first time, but the breath, whenever that has been for you, the breath that rises and falls in rhythm with the pulse of the tides, steady, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower, but in a steady cycle of in and out, flowing to and fro. And I'd like to begin our meditation with a short clip from an interview with novelist Jenny Offill, who, spe who speaks here of how difficult it is to express the complexity and scope of caring for another living soul. When I heard what she had to say, I thought about how sometimes because we don't have the words for things, we fail to really see them. So I'm sharing this to remind us not only to rely on words in order to experience the sublime. I just wanted that combination of, of, um, of just the everyday and, and, and then the transcendent. Um, you know, parenthood is really that way, in my experience. Go ahead and share that clip. Very, very strange. how you can just be there with a dirty diaper one minute and the next minute just sort of having your mind blown, not so much by some something that's been said or by some, you know, kind of hallmark moment, but more just by, by some strange sense that this, that indeed this, this is like a creature with a soul and you're, you are charged with, um, with raising, <laughs> raising this person. Um, and it's really kind of amazing. And I think that the, the discourse we usually have around it is it, it doesn't really allow either poll. Like you can only talk about the, the tedium and the, the hard parts about it if you do it in a really jokey way. Don't talk about the loneliness of it. And then you can only talk about the, the, the happy moments if you talk about them in a sort of cheerful way, not in a sublime way. And the, the sublime is actually something that is both, both awesome and terrifying. That swing back and forth is really important to me. And, She says, indeed, this is a creature with a soul. Are you in a position to nurture 
anyone, to nurture yourself into fullness, If so, think for a moment about this, them, you, as nurturing a creature with a soul. She says we only talk about the tedium and the hard parts about it. You only talk about the tedium and the hard parts if you do it in a jokey way. You don't talk about the loneliness of it. Let's acknowledge that responsibility is not always shared. Certainly not always a matter of give and take. Loneliness can appear even as we hold someone in our arms. Loneliness can be a matter of having to express ourselves in ways that aren't fully true to our experience. She says, we only talk about the happy moments in a cheerful way, not, not in a sublime way. Do we even have the language for the sublime? Do we maybe lose track of the experience of the divine, the sublime, the transcendent, because we lack language to express it? Take a moment now, if you'd like, to express what cannot be expressed with words. Maybe use your arms, stand, or dance. Imagine, perhaps, that you have helium balloons tied to each wrist. Does it lift every part of your body from the tips of your toes to the depths of your soul. The sublime is both awesome and terrifying, she says. What might make the sublime terrifying? Is it large and uncontainable? Is it that you might be responsible for something uncontainable? How might you embrace something so awesome without the illusion that you encompass it? But perhaps that in being you, you are one with the souls as intimate as they are unknowable. Let's keep breathing now and sync with one another despite our geographical separations. Breathing in sync with loved ones, living and dead, near and far. And remaining with our eyes closed, listen for their voices, feeling their nonverbal vibrations. Maybe take just a few seconds to open your eyes to type a sentence or less into the chat box about what rises in you at this moment. Sadness and joy, disconnection and longing, peace and gratitude. And you can keep your eyes closed and I will read from the chat.
My mother sure loved me, even though I was not what she expected. I miss her and my dad. Sunny, Samish, solitude. Gratitude for being accepted despite it all. Bittersweet to all the rescue animals I've loved and cared for. Belly breathing with future generations. Grateful for my mother, from whom I heard more than 200 piano lessons before I was even born. People who are gone are still there. From my mother I learned acceptance, unconditional acceptance. Gratitude for all the mothers I've had over the years. Gratitude that my very young mom gave birth to me and she raised me without good role models or much support. Moments of life from my partner who is with the universe. And embracing together now all of the unspoken, unwritten, unexpressible feelings and moments and vibrations in our bodies that may be impossible to contain but impossible to express. Embracing it all as we embrace one another. I'll ring the bell and let us return together. And now we'll hear from Laura Lee. Good morning, and thank you for Zooming in. What's my line? I'm Laura Lee Carboni, your auction promoter, and the game starts today. Yes, the Great Buff Auction starts today online and runs through May 23rd. That means you can start bidding now and help us climb that $10,000 pyramid we need to support the good work of the fellowship. First, a huge thank you to all our donors. We have over 125 items to bid on. Don't be left out. There is something for everyone. Fabulous hosted events, unique items, treasures, services, now for the nuts and bolts. Let's log on together. <coughs> all right, I hope you all can see my screen. Um, all right, if you have forgotten the auction website, it is togetherauction.com slash buff. Make sure you have the buff in lower 
case. Okay, and if you forget, here I am on buff.org, you can go right down here to Together Auction or let the bidding begin. Okay, so let's go over to our Buff Auction website. Here we are, togetherauction.com slash buff in lowercase. Now we're going to log on. This is up in the upper right corner here. And you simply enter your phone number. So I'm, and your phone number is 10 digits with hyphens. So I'm gonna enter mine here. And your PIN is simply the last four digits of that phone number. If that doesn't work and you're a couple, try phone, both phone numbers. Not in the database, no problem. Just click on Add Me and complete the new member, member profile. All right. Now, let's take a look at the bidding process. All right, I want to view the catalog. I can go to a grid up here, catalog grid, or catalog list. You can see some of the categories, tickets, apparel and fashion, artwork, food, home and garden. Mmm, wow, look at those cookies. Those look pretty delicious, Judy. All right, let's see. I'm looking for, oh, this hosted event. This sounds really fun. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to click to place a bid. Yes, I want to get in on that murder mystery party. And so I just click on place bid, put in my quantity, and save. Now, don't worry if you are outbid on any item, you will be notified via email. So you can get right back in there and put in another bid. We encourage you to share the event with all your friends, either by word of mouth or on your Facebook page. The auction is open to all. And up in the Hollywood squares are Debbie Boots, Pam Ives, Henry Ohana and I, our auction team, and we're ready to help you with any issues on the Together Auction website. Just email us at auction at buff.org or give any one of us a phone call. Thanks. Thank you, Laura Lee. Before we have our special music, we're giving special recognition to our keyboard artist, Andrea Rackle. As the music director here at Buff, I, Kevin Allen Schmid, want to thank you for your competent, inspiring, and always fresh playing for our services, both on Sunday morning and for Teze. As a member of the staff and representing the board and the whole congregation, we love your playing and we look forward to it and, it's, and uh, we never know what we're gonna get. Like you don't know what you're gonna get if you're improvising. It's a very special skill she brings and unique to us. Officially, <clears throat> this is 25 years since Andrea started teaching piano lessons. So it, she says 30 actually. Oh, I got the number wrong. 30 years since she started teaching when she was a teen. And she has made an illustrious career in the community, not only as a teacher, but as a professional player, giving concerts and playing for the symphony. And um, she's also mother, mother of Rose, also known as Allie and the daughter of Reverend Barbara Gilday, our buff member. So this is the best day to recognize your 30 years of teaching and your 
wonderful service to Buff as a keyboard artist. Thank you, Andrea. And now for the special music today, because it's Mother's Day, <clears throat> we have three singers, starting with Jane Ronka Washburn, I'll go second, and uh, Ellie Friedlob. We will take turns with the three verses of Bobby McFerrin's Psalm 23. You may find this in your Teal Hymn Book, number 1038. Bobby McFerrin, as you know, is that improvisation expert who can sing all the parts. And this, I think he created this as a, as a sound scape where he sang all the different parts in a chant-like style in a, in a feminine version of the 23rd Psalm and dedicated it to his mother. So listen for that if you can find that on YouTube. And uh, today, because we, we wanted to be able to sing clearly without our masks on, the three of us singers decided the way we would do it is sing one verse solo each. And we'll start with Jane. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. She makes me lie down in green meadows beside the still waters. She will lead. She restores my soul. She writes my wrongs. She leads me in the path of good things. She fills my heart with songs. Even though I walk through a dark and dreary land, there is nothing that can shake me. She has said she won't forsake me. I'm in her hand. She sets a table before me in the presence of my foes. She anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, surely goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will live in her house forever, forever. You're muted. Hi, I'm Kat McIntyre. I'm a member of Buff's Black Lives Matter Ministry Action Team. 
This Mother's Day morning, I'm reading you a letter from Twitter written by a Black mother, Sabrina Vasa Brown, in June 2020. For all my white friends, fellow parents in my children's school, neighborhood, sports teams, etc., I'm keeping it to 100. So here's the truth. Do not even ask me for a play date, sleepover, babysitting, meet up, or even send a birthday invite unless you can openly talk with me and others about how you are actively being anti-racist as a parent, auntie, uncle, etc. If you have children in your life and you are not talking with them about racism, you are privileging whiteness and perpetuate perpetuating white supremacy. It is not enough to say, I love you and your kids. Or my favorite, your kids are so beautiful, my kids love your kids. I am raising two bright, exceptional, and beautiful Black children who are blackety black black. They are not here to make your child feel good or give you a black kid photo op, or help you feel better because you live a segregated, insular life surrounded mostly by people that look like you. And my family is one of the only black families you know in the city. Okay, state. What I may have tolerated before 2020, I damn sure won't anymore because I am tired of the same conversations. Think of it as a new expectation for my parental friendship, if you must. If I have to teach my nine-year-old and been doing it since he was five, how to behave, talk, dress, to be able to survive in this world as a black boy, you better believe I expect you to teach your child to be anti-racist, no excuses. Don't talk about it, be about it. Check out at parent at curious.parenting for more information and resources. Thank you. I first met Andrea playing Chopin here at Buff. I watched her hands dance and thought, she is the piano teacher I've been waiting for. In the past three years, Andrea has unlocked worlds of music in me. Andrea, as a teacher and as a friend, you inspire, intuit, know how to listen, and gently guide me closer to my true self. I celebrate that you are here. I cherish all that I learned from you, and I delight in knowing you. In honor of your recent birthday and 30-year career as an amazing teacher, I'd like to celebrate by playing a piece that you helped me bring forth. It's called Twirl.
So recently, I came across a photo from 1989 of me, Teacher Sue, with my group of 14 preschoolers that year. I hadn't seen this picture for more than 20 years, but everyone's name came right back. Each face recalled memories of tender growth and joyful play together. I remember Alex with a tracheostomy whose bedroom was outfitted like a hospital room. Alex wanted to climb the tree at school. We worried about the risk and ran it by her mom, who begged us to let her try. I'll always remember standing beneath her, cheering her as she climbed high overhead in the branches, beaming in full joy and power. There was Abe in the sandbox, stormy-faced, swinging arms and fists in circles near the boy, using the shovel that he desperately wanted. I stood near him, quietly saying, you really want that blue shovel. This is so hard for you. Until he knew his feelings were heard, enough to drop his fists, melt in my lap, and cry like the frustrated three-year-old that he was. None of us are really ready to move on until we feel heard. What a creative privilege to observe and learn how to meet each child exactly where they are, inside and out, and support their growth forward through the mediums of play and expression. How rewarding to share with parents another view of their child in the world beyond home and become a supportive team. I loved teaching preschool for 17 years. I loved teaching early childhood education for 13 years after in a community college. My husband was an oncology nurse for 20 years. At a July 4th block party where I used to live, a neighbor asked me, you have any kids? When I answered no, he said, yeah, I used to be a hedonist too until my wife opened my eyes, and now we have two beautiful kids. In both my and my husband's careers, we were intrinsically involved in caring for people's lives in intimate and important moments. To be fully present and committed to nurturing care is deep, enriching, and creative work. It calls for being ever open to learning problem solving, and helping manifest what is useful in that moment. Few people, especially the mothers of my preschoolers, could comprehend that I could be so dedicated to valuing children, yet intentionally choose not to have my own. Many times I heard statements like, oh, your biological clock will start ticking, that's what happened to me, or but you'll be such a great mom. I learned about Eric Erickson's psychosocial stages of how we develop as humans when I was teaching preschool. At every age, we face a developmental challenge whose outcome either builds a core virtue or will be unfinished business we can hopefully resolve further down the road. Erickson's middle adulthood stage that coincides with childbearing years is called generativity versus self-absorption or stagnation. Generativity means to create positive changes that will nurture others and outlast oneself. It is being part of the bigger picture of life, giving back to society that makes one feel useful and purposeful, and that leads to the virtue of care. When there is no generativity in our adult lives, we risk feeling stagnant and unproductive, disconnected from the great web of community and society as a whole. Having children is a path into the heart of generativity, and 
It is not the only path. Clearly, my neighbor believed that I had to generate children or I was a self-absorbed hedonist. Despite 30 years of nurturing and educating thousands of children, parents, and adults. Well, focusing on Mother's Day, there are infinite ways to share and care for children, parents, and our community at large. We need what black and indigenous feminisms call other mothers, folks that care for and about everyone's children, like the dachshund, whether or not they have children of their own. <laughs> That supports parents' responsibilities in raising children, share useful in knowledge, and lead children to expect that their needs will be met by their community as a whole. On a wider scale, Bernice Johnson Reagan of Sweet Honey in the Rock says, mothering is best understood as cultural work, the way a community organizes itself to nurture itself and future generations. So yes, it does take a village. It should take a village. Children grow up watching us. They, want, they grow up watching us and wanting to be and do that too. The more grown-ups in their life modeling authentic choices, showing that growing up is exciting, the better. Nurture has no biological requirement. Mothering and fathering in the world can be a wide-ranging act. One does not require seeing a genetic mirror of the self in the next generation to care for it. The world needs both. It needs us all to care. Thank you. I asked a few people this week to share stories that I might share with you. The demographics of people who traditionally get recognized on Mother's Day is pretty narrow. So I asked Lee Seaman, Julie Guy, Liz Roberts, and someone who asked that I not use her name to share a bit about their experiences of nurturing and being nurtured. 
Lee Seaman thought for a bit and then decided to tell me about her aloe vera plant. As she gets older, Lee says, she knows that she does not want to go through this period of her life on her own. Friendship, though, she noted, does not always come easy. It takes intention and follow through. Knowing this, one might hesitate and not even begin until finding the perfect person to fit into the holes in their lives. Lee is a professional translator. Before the pandemic, she traveled frequently to Japan to visit clients. Even before the pandemic, though, she used Zoom and wanting to look professional, Lee was very intentional about setting up her background with a shelf of neatly arranged books. Then, for a sense of balance, she wanted to add a bonsai tree. I could imagine why she would do that. Not only does it seem culturally appropriate, there is something about bonsai that, despite its organic shape and feel, is also graceful but deliberate. Bonsai, though, are not so easy to come by, says Lee. So she added her aloe vera plant to the Zoom shelf. The aloe vera, she says, does not fit at all into the space between the vertical clean lines of the books. More significantly, it's not in any sense under control. Aloe vera lobes shoot out any way that they want, like some alien creature. It's almost like anti-bonsai. It spreads and spreads and take up, takes up space on its own terms in ways that Lee cannot predict. When I asked Lee about nurturing, she pointed out that while she has had mentoring relationships with younger people, she's now at that point in her life that she's looking to nurture more horizontally, which I took to mean in relationships of equals. But mutuality does not mean sameness. It does not mean having an exact fit. It definitely does not mean predictable or unchanging. So Lee pointed out that by, when she looks at her aloe vera plant, she sees all of this messiness and also sees compatibility. And she, that's what came to her mind when I asked her about nurture. Julie Guy takes a more deliberate approach, but she has no illusion that nurturing will be simple and straightforward. When I asked her to say more, she told me that being single, her desire to have an impact on future generations has played out in public life, not in the spotlight, but as a regular person who so much wants the best for her community that now in her 90s, she is still initiating neighborhood projects that she knows may take many years or even decades to come to fruition. For instance, as she saw the Cordata neighborhood expanding, she wanted to make sure that there would be play areas and parks for all to enjoy, and in particular so that kids could run and play. After many years of persistence, there is now a beautiful new park in Cordata called Juliana Park with open space, trails, picnic areas, and a glorious forest. Now that that's settled, she says, she's organizing neighbors and talking to city officials to get a branch library in Cordata. She's raising money too specifically to ensure that the children's section of the library-to-be will be diverse, stimulating, and nurturing place for learning and growing. Julie also told me that she had just finished reading a book about a conversation between Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, who had found that despite their differences, what they'd learned from life was that by bringing joy to others, 
they brought joy to themselves. Speaking of librarians, Liz Roberts also has stories of nurture to share. She was planting blueberries when I called. Blueberry plants, of course, do not produce immediately, but take ongoing tending and tenderness across at least a few years until they mature and bear fruit. Liz thinks of her relationship with the earth as both mothering and being mothered. Liz also told a couple of stories about her parents. With her mother, it went like this. As a teenager, she noticed that her mother was backing off from the hugginess. Today, Liz isn't sure why that might have been or whether her mom might have done this consciously. She speculates that since she had three older brothers, maybe her mom anticipated that this is what happens with children. They begin to need their own space. But Liz was not going to have any of that. When she noticed that the hugginess was diminishing, but not the support, not the love, not the other forms of nurture, she started going out of her way to reinitiate the hugs and the physical closeness, to give a deliberate signal that this is what she wanted and needed. And before long, her mom got it. And once again, that particular kind of affection became an important part of their ongoing relationship. Her father, Liz said, showed affection in different ways. It was not so physical, and it was with few words. But a particular memory came to mind. She says that as a 4-H kid, she exhibited at fairs in categories of egg cookery and chicken barbecue. Once, she won the Louisiana State Championship in chicken barbecue and came home with a gigantic trophy with a chicken on top. That night, her father came into her room, sat next to her on the bed, and said simply, I'm proud of you. It was a brief but powerful moment, Liz said. Not unusual, but emblematic of the way she, the way she knew the depths of his love without relying on it coming out in any specific form. And finally, someone who prefers not to be named but was happy to share her story to, that I could share it with you told me this. In the last years of their lives, her parents moved to Bellingham. They could not get around easily, so it was very special that on a regular basis, she and her mom went out together to get their hair done. Her mom, our storyteller says, would often encourage her to get a shorter cut. One time the stylist asked, how do you think your daughter looks? Her mom said, oh, I think it's a little uneven. Why don't you take a little off the left side? And now, oh, still a little uneven. I think you need to take a little off the right, and so on. Afterward, her mom said, I didn't do that on purpose, but so I think that's a little too short. On reflection then, our storyteller noted that growing up as a boy in the 1970s with long hair then, he'd heard many times that his hair was too long. Oddly enough, she said, now that her mother has died, she finds herself keeping her hair short. We all have our own circumstances and needs, ways of showing and receiving love. In all of the ways that you have of showing your love to one another and to the larger community by supporting Buff as a place where all are welcome your gifts, we are very, very grateful for your gifts. You'll see a slide up on the screen now that shows 
different ways that you can contribute financially in addition to all the ways that you live out your contributions to our mission. You can donate to Buff on buff.org with MasterCard or Visa or PayPal. You can use the phone app Give Plus or you can mail us a check payable to Buff. Thank you so much for your nurturing of full, all generations. I just wanted to say thank you for your tributes, um, Kevin, and and all the cards that I re received from so many of you, and Sue, your really meaningful tribute. Thanks for making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just want to say how Buff has been a wonderful nurturing place for me as well. So thank you. And I'm going to share for the offertory today a piece called Sai Bei Dance Number no. One by um, Chinese Canadian composer An Lun Huang. Thank you, Andrea. And let's sing together now from the Gray Hymnal, number 23, Bring Many Names.
I want to quickly let you know that on Sunday, May 23rd at 1 o'clock, the annual congregational meeting will be held on Zoom. Barbara Gilday, head of the nominating committee, will present the three candidates for board trustee positions, and she will present the five candidates for next year's nominating committee. You can find more information about all these candidates uh, in the midweek update, which you'll find at buff.org. Our treasurer, Sky Hedman, will present the proposed 2021-22 budget, and that too is on buff.org. We will vote on the board and nominating committee candidates and on the budget, so please join us after the service. Also um, on that day, our Sunday service will be led by the Buff staff, who will share some thoughts on serving the congregation during the pandemic. So uh, I look forward to, we're doing teamwork all the time, but it'll be fun to share the pulpit together. Um, you can find out more about Buff. I hope that uh, if you're visiting, you'll give me a call or an email. I'm at paul at buff.org or minister at buff.org and you can sign up for our newsletter on buff.org. And you can also see an ad for two jobs that we have posted for a full-time administrator and a part-time bookkeeper. So if you or someone you know would be interested in those positions, please send them to us. As we extinguish the chalice here and in our homes, let us take forward the light and warmth in our hearts, knowing that we have been nurtured, knowing that we all have the capacity to go on nurturing with gratitude. And let's sing together, circle round for freedom. Yeah. Uh -huh. 